Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Today's session is part of our Climate Change and Health series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center, the MGH Center for the Environment and Health, and the MGH Institute of Health Professions Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice, and Health. Before we get started, I just want to go a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so we can hear our guest speakers today. If you have any questions for our guest speakers, you may use a chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speakers will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. All right, so next, I would like to introduce you all to our guest speakers. Joining us today, we have Dr. Patrice Nicholas. Dr. Nicholas is Distinguished Teaching Professor and Director of the MSGH Institute of Health Professions Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice, and Health. She is also the Co-Director for Policy and Advocacy of the MGH Center for the Environment and Health. She teaches in the Doctor of Nursing Practice Program and advises accelerated Bachelor of Science in Nursing students at the MGH Institute. She also serves at the MGH Center for the Environment and Health on behalf of the Department of Nursing and Patient Care Services. Joining us, we also have Dr. Sue Ellen Brakey. Dr. Brakey is Distinguished Teaching Associate Professor in the School of Nursing and Associate Director of the Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health at the MGH Institute of Health Professions at Charlestown. Her clinical background includes global health and critical care nursing. Dr. Brakey teaches in the Doctor of Nursing Practice and accelerated BSN programs with a focus on ethics, evidence-based practice and population health. They join us today to give a talk on the importance of communication about climate change. So please join me in welcoming Drs. Nicholas and Brakey. I'm just opening my slides. There they are. Sorry. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for welcoming Dr. Brakey and me again this month to talk about a really important topic, the importance of climate change communication. Uh, we, before the session began, we were talking about the fact that we had a monthly, we have a monthly webinar series. And yesterday, Dr. Ed Maybach, who's uh, really world renowned for climate change communication, he's a public health professional by background, located at the George Mason University and uh, also working with the Yale School of Public Health Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health. So today we'll talk a little bit about our role at the MGH Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health. What is climate change communication? What are the roles of health professionals as well as people in the lay public in addressing climate change and health? What we all need to know, whether we're health professionals or people in the audience who are committed to climate change and spreading the word, it's our responsibility, and that there are trusted voices in climate change communication. Special thanks to Amy Sam, who's led these sessions monthly over the past year, which we're, we're very grateful, and Brian, Dr. Brian French, as well as the MGH Department of Nursing and Patient Care Services. So one of the things that you may find most interesting, and you can easily Google this, is that there is a major survey that's been conducted for since the mid uh, 2015 approximately called Global Warming Six America, Americas. And the most recent report came out in December, 2022. So over time, 
they survey U.S. citizens, U.S. Americans, excuse me, uh, about their beliefs about climate change and health. This is just a lens on our Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health. We actually hold a symposium uh, annually in April that is open for health professionals as well as, as the public to spread the word about climate change. In addition, there are professional audiences where climate change is discussed. This was a symposium on climate crisis and clinical practice that was held at Harvard Medical School, led by Dr. Renee Salas and Dr. Karen Solomon from the New England Journal of Medicine. And nursing was represented on the panel, along with physicians and hospital executives. And because of the, um, the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient and Family Learning Center, the word got out about climate change and our center was invited to present on behalf of the MGH Center for the Environment and Health, the Blum Center, and our own MGH Center on climate change and health. Of note is that a high school student worked with me to, to also focus on the impacts on wildlife. So for example, during periods of wildfires, loss of wildlife is tremendous. It's not an area that we're focused on as much because we're focusing primarily on the health of people, but that really broadened our knowledge about impacts on wildlife and was of great interest at the Museum of Science. This is an article in Annals of Global Health on roles of health professionals in climate change communication, and it really addressed effective engagement. And for example, in the clinical encounter, it's incredibly important to talk about climate change with elders during periods of high heat and heat waves. It's important that discussions occur about protecting their health. And for example, in pediatric visits, it may be covered to address sunscreen and protection from the sun, but in periods of high ambient heat, it's also important to talk about children in camps and protecting their health from heat-related illness. This is a snapshot of Global Warming Six Americas from the Yale uh, Program on Climate Change Communication. And the Six Americas, you can see that the categories are alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. And the captions and the pictures are really quite interesting. The person being alarmed, see, looking extremely alarmed, the person concerned really reading more about the problem. And this tells you a little bit more about global, sorry, global warming six Americas. So the alarmed are those most engaged with global warming. They're convinced it's happen, happening and human caused. They're very worried about it and they strongly support climate action. The concerned are also convinced global warming is happening and human caused, but they worry about it less and are less motivated to take action. The cautious are uncertain about whether or not global warming is happening and human caused and are not very worried about it. So they are less motivated to act. The disengaged are largely unaware of global warming the doubtful question whether it's happening or human caused and perceive it as low risks. So they are among the least motivated to, to act. And then the dismissive reject the idea that it's happening and human caused, do not view it as a threat and tend to strongly oppose climate policies. And I'd like you to take a minute and think about where do you think you belong in the global warming six Americas? Do you think that you're alarmed concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, or dismissive. This is a, a snapshot up until 2022 of global warming six Americas over the last decade. And you can see the categories are all listed there. And it's interesting to note that the alarmed have increased from 12% on the left side axis to 26% on the right side. 
and the concerns from 26% up one point to 27%. The cautious have decreased by 12 points. At the disengaged have remained about the same, the doubtful down by two points, and the dismissive have actually increased in a minor fashion to, from 10% to 11%. But most importantly, perhaps, is that the alarmed and the concerned are nearing 50% of global warming in the United, the, the six Americas in the United States. And this was from 2020, and it's a snapshot. It's actually reversed in order, but even by 2020, the alarmed had increased 15 points. The concerns were down by two points, in part because they moved into the alarmed categories. And then communication about climate change, and Dr. Brakey's going to talk about the challenges and opportunities and the messages we should share. Thanks, Patrice. Um, uh, yeah, so there we know that there are some challenges in communicating the impacts of climate change to um, all kinds of groups of people. And, and honestly, Patrice and I know because we've done a lot of um, education with healthcare providers and educators, we know that it's not just the lay public that needs to learn more about climate change. It's actually um, the people who are going to be seeing the health impacts directly um, in the clinical setting. And because, you know, healthcare is such a large sector globally, it's also important for um, healthcare providers to understand the impacts of climate change because they have a role in um, impacting policy development and, and mitigation and resilience strategies. So um, the increases in those that are alarmed and concerned about climate change is closely linked with understanding that this is harming our communities. And the other thing I noticed um, on the last two slides was that on the second slide, which was from 2015 to 2020, the dismissive actually went from 12 to 7%. And so they're holding steady at 7%, and that might actually, we'll see what, what's interesting about that dismissive group um, is that I think for all of the groups, but particularly those who have been most, um, the least interested in thinking about this issue, uh, is that we're seeing it. We're seeing it on the news. Um, it's much more, it's, it's still not completely covered in our weather reports or the news, but people are making the connections between these droughts, wildfire, um, extreme weather events. They're seeing it and they're feeling it a little bit more closely than they had in the past. So it's important to really continue to communicate with people um, that this is a health issue, this is a public health issue that gives it more traction as well, um, but that this public health issue is actually impacting health, not only health, but it has economic impacts. I mean, these extreme weather events cost billions of dollars in, um, in different communities. Um, and so this is impacting our infrastructure. So in, in addition to thinking about this on an individual level, we need to be thinking about it in terms of how is how are our communities being impacted um, on the whole. Next slide, Patrice. So we know, and this came, this this information I'm sharing um, came out of um, George Mason University and the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. And some of it I, you know, put into the slide after we had the opportunity to hear Dr. Maybach speak yesterday. Um, but this is the general thinking: is that, you know, our ideas about climate change are shaped by our own personal experiences our mental and cultural models, um, and our underlying values and worldviews. And so, you know, it is still regarded maybe a little bit less, but for instance, it's still regarded as a political issue. And Dr. Maybach was, um, one of the questions they ask 
in their survey is what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of global warming and polar bears is still um, the, the top thing that people think about. And if you think about polar bears, you know, that, that gives distance to the problem and it can make people think if that's what they attribute to climate change or they relate to climate change, it can feel very distant and something that's not impacting them. And politics still comes up um, as something that people think about as well. So we have to, we have to shift that mindset to really under, getting people to understand that this is a public health issue and a personal health issue as well. Next slide. Um, and so a, another way to think of this, and this website that I have here, Climate Exchange, um, is a great website that has not only some tips around communicating climate change, um, but also you can kind of drill into your own state and see what kind of policies are in place around climate change mitigation and resilience and um, where they're where they are in in the process of getting passed and so it's um, I would encourage you to kind of if this is something you're interested in you know take a look at that website and play around with it um, but the way we think about climate change is also as I mentioned spatial um, so this idea that um, it's impacting other people, it's impacting the polar bears who live a long way from me, it's temporal. So thinking about, well, this is going to happen in the future, it's not really happening now, which we all know is not the case. And then also um, psychological. So all three of these, there's a dissonance, a cognitive dissonance we have with understanding the challenge, the climate change is happening. Um, so psychologically, um, there might be an element of denial. We know that there are certainly people and kids in particular um, who have a lot of climate anxiety, have eco-anxiety, um, you know, depression around the, the thinking of what climate change can do to our communities and ourselves and our future generations. And so some people may choose to kind of um, ignore that or not deny, but kind of put it in a parking lot in their psyche. Um, there are also language barriers. So it's really important that when we're getting the message out about climate change and how that's impacting health in particular, um, we have to be mindful of making sure these messages are happening in different languages because you know we are a diverse society and it's really important too because it's often um, English language learners or people from diverse backgrounds who are most at risk for the impacts of climate change, not only the, the health risks, but the risks to the infrastructure in their communities. So we have to be sure that we're um, reaching out to all all groups within um, within our communities, and then there's a need to move from public concern. So it's really important to get people to understand what's happening, but then to get people to act and support actions and solutions. And so really moving the needle from awareness, which is critically important because people aren't going to want to act until they really understand what the problem is. Um, but then really getting them to, to act and support actions. And that, again, that includes um, all communities. And so empowering maybe those communities that are um, more disenfranchised to understand the impacts that it's having on them. And so, you know, maybe creating, and there, there are parts, there are groups that are doing this, you know, creating grassroots organizations to get the people who are being impacted to really move forward on action and changing policy. Next slide, please. So a few tips for how, how do you communicate about climate change? And a lot of people, um, you know, one way to do this, and I think the, the way people feel most comfortable is to really go out and um, communicate with your family and your friends about this is in, how this is impacting them and really getting people 
engaged in understanding, which again, then can lead to action. Um, but think about the story you're telling. And, you know, if, if any of you on the call have done any kind of organizing, it really starts with a good story. Um, you know, as clinicians and as educators, we often try to um, motivate people by facts. It's kind of where we lean. What's, what is the evidence? What are the facts? But what really gets people thinking and what can really change minds is when you start telling a story and a personal story and how perhaps you've been impacted by climate change, um, whether that's through health impact you've had um, related to wildfire or um, flooding or extreme weather, but your story can be really impactful. Um, include hope in the messaging, possibility, and human agency. So by human agency, I mean, we all have the ability to make a difference. You know, we can act and we can contribute to, um, to making a difference around climate change, whether that's through uh, political, political action or whether that's through increasing awareness within our communities or helping to build more resilient communities. And Another tip is to really connect this to things that people already care about. So it doesn't have to be, climate change doesn't have to be central to the message, but what is it that people care about and how will that be impacted? So for instance, um, you know, do you have friends who love to go to the beach and what's happening to your beaches? Are they being eroded through climate change? Um, uh, that's just one example, you know, do people, like to, um, are the things that they like to do, is that being impacted by air pollution or some other and heat? Are they able to do the things they like? For instance, Patrice mentioned kids. Um, and one big area of concern is for um, young people and adults who like to play sports in the summer or go outside running in the summer. And this will all be impacted, and it already has been, by not only heat, but also the combination of heat and air pollution. And, you know, don't shy away from uncertainty. There are aspects of climate change, some of the data that is um, not as, um, you know, people, that there is some uncertainty and that's, that doesn't mean that we don't know enough about what's happening and what will, what will happen if this continues. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, use storytelling, but you can, all, you can also use that to share some of the data. Next slide, please. And so um, when you think about who are the trusted voices for climate change communication, um, certainly, you know, I'll, I'll put in the plug for health providers of, of all kinds, not only nurses and doctors, but um, physical therapists, um, occupational therapists, um, speech language pathologists, we all have a role to play, uh, social workers, we all have a role to play in addressing climate change and educating the public. And so many people um, trust, and, and this, by the way, this also comes out of the work that of Dr. Maybach and his, his colleagues, but many people trust NASA, they trust climate scientists, um, TV weather forecasters, um, as I mentioned, health providers, public health professionals. Um, and this varies, but some of the work that they do, they look at people's kind of political affiliation from um, liberal to very conservative. And so who is trusted? The, it, it changes within those different groups. So um, there, you can't really say all Americans trust NASA the most, or they trust health providers the most, or they trust climate scientists. It shifts depending on your political viewpoints, which I think is a really interesting aspect of their, um, their data, which by the way, if you go to the Yale program for climate change communication, they have a website they have all of their um, past studies are um, are listed on their website, and again, they're 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 written in in 
a format that is uh, user friendly for the lay public. Um, they've also found that most registered voters think schools should teach children about global warming, um, not only the causes and consequences, but potential solutions, which I think is incredibly important since they're really the next generation and the, they're the ones who are being, will be saddled with um, even more significant impacts. And educators, not only at the um, higher ed level, but within our, you know, K through 12 also have a role to play in having, in helping people understand the threats of climate change. Next slide, Patrice. So this is one, um, I'm unable to actually see the bottom of the slide, but he, he talked a lot about um, when you're delivering a message, you you want it to be simple, but you know this is one of this is the message he Dr. Maybach kind of delivered to us. It's real. It, it's us. Experts agree. It's bad. There's hope, and others care. Um, so within those twelve words, it really sums up what's happening. So we know global warming is happening. We know climate change is real. Um, Ninety-seven percent of climate scientists who are um, practicing agree that it's man-made, um, that the, the, the majority of climate change is related to human activity. And there is expert consensus on this. We know it's bad. We've talked about, you know, this is really the largest public health threat of the 21st century. And its impacts um, are unequally distributed and the most vulnerable among us are the most impacted. The key part of this message here is that there is hope, that there are actions that we can take um, and that others care. So there are more people worried about climate change than you might imagine. And one of the things that stops people from talking about this is that they think that they're alone in their thinking. Um, so again, one of the things to do is just to reach out and you know begin conversations with your um, your family and your friends, people you work with, and try to gauge how they feel. Next slide. So the best way to convey a message is to be simple, as the last message was, to have a very simple message, very clear message, repeat it often, and have that message be repeated by a variety of trusted and caring voices. And we mentioned some of those trusted and caring voices on the previous slide. Next slide. So um, evidence-based, evidence kind of tells us that effective climate messages show health impacts, which people can relate to because we all worry and want to we are we're all concerned about our health and we all want to achieve optimal health it talks about policy policy solutions and these are the top five renewable energy or and reduced energy waste climate smart foods farms and food systems um, clean and active transportation ways to improve our buildings and homes and ways to improve our community environments. So this is what people care about. This hits people um, where they live. And it's really, um, and, and the last thing is to uh, affirm helpful social norms. So again, we all wanna be a healthy, we all wanna live in healthy communities. We all want our neighbors to be healthy and um, minimally impacted by the impacts of climate change. And so, these are, these are effective climate messages, um, but without talking about policy solutions that people can actually employ themselves, um, that's really the most impactful part of the messaging. And so it should always be included in the messaging. So, uh, and we've done a lot of messaging around health impacts. Um, and when I've, when I've thought about this, we haven't necessarily always included policy solutions. I think we, as you know, our center was developed in 2017. I think as we've evolved, we add uh, much more around policy solutions. Um, but it, that's a really important 
piece of it is because you want to get people to move toward action. So they need to be aware, but then the more we can get a groundswell of action, the more, um, the better off we'll be in terms of addressing the health impacts of climate change and also the impacts of climate change that are affecting us individually in, and in our communities. Next slide, Patrice. I'll turn it Thank over you. to you. Thank you, Swellen. So part of the, the work that Swellen and I have been doing is uh, developing other faculty and also sharing the message broadly with the community about climate change and health. This is one example of educating nursing faculty about climate change and health. There was a report that the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine uh, published in 2021, and it's called The Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030, charting a path to achieve health equity. And of note is the fact that they talked about climate change in recommendation eight. Uh, however, the report primarily focused only on disaster preparedness and response. And part of what Suellen and I and Amy and Brian have been trying to accomplish with this series is to broaden the understanding of climate change, which often people think more explicitly as global warming, but it's broader, it's climate change. And that we need to educate the lay public and also health, also health professionals. So this was a paper that we published on the intersection of climate change and health. And we linked in the background from the Future of Nursing report and the importance of health equity because the populations most at risk are, are those who are also impacted by social determinants of health. This is a lens from, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine by Morello, Frosch and colleagues. And it shows how structural racism and inequality drive the climate gap. And this is an important message to communicate about climate change as well. On the left-hand side, you can see housing and land use policies were rooted in structural racism. There was discrimination in real estate and lending industries often known as redlining dispossession of indigenous communities from land. And this led to racial segregation, wealth and income inequality and inequities in political power that intersect with climate change. From there, it led to sacrifice zones. So for example, there were often sites of industrial facilities and highways in communities of color and low income communities. And the more privileged community communities benefit most from industrial pollution solely as producers and consumers, but have less exposure. The regul there's regulatory abandonment of racially and socioeconomically marginalized groups. And these all lead to disparities in exposures to fossil fuel related pollution and higher pollution levels overall. Swellen actually apprised me of a community group in East Boston through her, her fellowship, her community organizing fellowship with Cambridge Health Alliance and Harvard Medical School, where uh, the community group brought to the attention of others the fact that the East Boston community is disproportionately impacted by air pollution, by airplanes, and also car exhaust from um, from car lift rides that leave their cars running. So that it was a very enlightening fact to me and an, a, a, an area where we need to become more community engaged and also communicate that message. And then um, the climate gap, racial and class-based disparities exist in the effects of extreme heat, precipitation, drought, drought, wildfire, housing loss, sea level rise, and displacement, all resulting in unequal health effects. 
This is a very busy slide, but it's from an excellent article that's published in the Journal of Climate Change and Health. And it, the, the pictograph actually focuses on heat exposure and how climate change is increasing the frequency of extreme heat events and rising average seasonal temperatures and has having several deleterious adverse health impacts on women. And some of them are very specific for health professionals as far as what a health professional should know in seeing a pregnant woman, for example. And what we also know from the health profession's literature is that black women in particular have many more adverse pregnancy outcomes, stillbirth, low birth, weight, preterm birth, because of exposure to heat and also uh, doubly due to the exposure to heat and poor air quality. And I'll call your attention to the lower right-hand corner because it focuses on institutional and public health solutions and also the patient encounter. So if you're a patient, you should be looking for discussions about how you avoid health harms, the negative symptoms of heat-related illness, behavioral changes to reduce risk. Do you have access to air conditioning or cooling centers? And the kinds of caution you need to have with diuretics and other water pills and other medications. And communicating these messages is also important with your families, with elders, with children. And then from an institutional and public health solution, um, under, having understanding about urban heat islands, which we have described previously, and the importance of in the fi lower, final lower right-hand corner, communication and awareness, in this case, for women's health risks, but more broadly, for everyone's health risks. And in the I'll go to the next slide. This article actually talked about roles of health professionals in addressing health consequences. Communication was one of the major themes that emerged from this paper. And this was a whole group of health professionals, Suell and myself, occupational therapists, a physician assistant. Uh, our librarian joined us in helping us search the literature to be sure that our paper would communicate the, the best message and a physician. We have also, um, with Suellen's leadership in particular, developed a screening tool for assessment of climate change related heat illness. Uh, it's called the heat, heat related illness screening tool, the HIST, H-I-S-T. And we're continuing work on that article because it's been pilot tested, in other words, in a small, group of patients and providers being used to actually help providers teach patients about uh, uh, what are heat related problems they may encounter and what to do about them. And then we developed a second tool for the emergency department called A-Climate, which is uh, um, an acronym to help emergency department clinicians be able to assess patients who come in, for example, during a heat wave. You'd be surprised how many health professionals, particularly in the emergency department, don't think about the fact that during a heat wave, many more patients come to the emergency department, elders at risk of heat-related illness and heat stroke. And there was a very uh, important study done at Boston Children's Hospital about the increase in pediatric visits during periods of heat wave. So we want to communicate that message broadly to health professionals, but also to the broader community of patients and families. And then there was a commentary about the paper that this is a very helpful tool. The uh, paper is added, of course, that tool had, it adds to the already busy lives of emergency department clinicians, but these authors actually talked about it being critically important. 
And then the other area for communication is about mental health impacts of climate change. And that that's important for emergency department clinicians and for patients and families to be aware of. So Ellen talked particularly about eco-anxiety in children. And there's also a concept called solastalgia, whereby children are fearful about the environment and the environmental changes that are occurring. And we know that children are having increased prevalence of anxiety and depression, and it also ties in to global warming and climate change. This is from PBS NewsHour, and it's a very interesting segment that is titled, The Hotter the Planet Grows, The Less Children Are Learning. And this study was out of Harvard, and it was done by a lab, an economist. And what he found via um, test scores taken by children is that for every one degree increase in temperature, children are learning 1% less in school. And it's, it's interesting to note that the Baltimore Public Schools in August each year actually publish a document about which schools have air conditioning and which do not. And they have warnings out that schools will close early if the temperature and the, uh, the humidity is too high or in those non-air conditioned schools and, or if the air conditioning systems are struggling. So I have a granddaughter in Boston Public Schools, second grade. I actually wrote as a grandparent to the superintendent of schools. And my understanding is at the same time, the teachers union was pushing because a lot of Boston Public Schools buildings are older. And for those of you who are Boston residents, if you drive around the city, you'll see that many of the old brick schools that weren't built with air conditioning now have window air conditioning throughout. What we know is that air conditioners consume energy and also contribute to climate change and global warming, but it's important for students and teachers to have healthy learning environments. And then the other issue as far as climate change communication Abram Lusgarten wrote a very interesting three-part series in the New York Times Magazine. And one of the pieces was how climate migration will reshape America. So what we know is that uh, climate change is changing our, uh, the Central America, the ability to farm. There have been increased hurricanes and floods that then have successful farmers in Central America losing their crops. So climate migration at the Southern border of the United States is also impacted by climate change. And that message needs to be shared more broadly as well. And finally, as far as climate communication, Suellen and I would like to share with you that through our climate center and our logo is in the middle, as well as Mass General Center for the Environment and Health and Brigham and Women's Hospital, we have an annual symposium. It was held on April 1st of this year, and it was called Climate Change and Health 2023, Achieving Human, Achieving Human and Planetary Health Through Sustainability Action. It was exceedingly well attended. The first um, keynote, a nurse, Barbara Sattler, who's a uh, professor emeritus at University of San Francisco was an exemplary speaker. And also Carlos Ferran de Guzman, who's at the University of Costa Rica and also University of Maryland, Baltimore shared incredible messages. And in closing, Bruce Bacar, who's a physician and has done work on climate change and impacts on women, particularly pregnant women, at, shares a message from polar bears to pregnant bellies that um, we, we need to move broadly in communicating about climate change health risks. And these are our resources. These resources are all from our center, from our steering committee, and uh, our dedicated steering committee and are available here as well. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. We are now at the end of the session. So if you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to enter them in the chat. We have a question regarding that annual symposium that happened in April. Was that by any chance recorded? Is there any way for us to access that? And yes, there is. Um, Marie, if you would um, email me and CC Amy, Sam, and Swellen, we can get that recording to you. Swellen, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's available for a certain period of time. And we can absolutely send that recording to you. And Amy, you can make it available more broadly. I will enter our Blum Center email in the chat. So feel free to send us an email. And thank you for in your interest in viewing that as well, Marie. Who can one contact if we are interested in learning more or wish to collaborate? Well, we're always interested in having members on the steering committee. So we would love to expand our steering committee and have you join us. And um, Swellen, do you want to talk about the steering committee? Sure. Um, when we when we developed the center in 2017, um, it was just a group of a few nursing faculty, really. And then um, since that time, we've expanded it. We have people from other schools. We have a physician assistant on there. We have um, staff from the Institute of Health Professions, um, faculty, and so we meet like every two weeks and. Um, what we're really focused on right now is trying to get out and do some more community engagement and advocacy. So as a matter of fact, after this call, I'm driving to Charlestown to um, to join the Charlestown Coalition, which is a coalition of different community-based organizations to clean up. Um, they're trying to develop a park right by the Bunker Hill housing development. Um, so I'm going to help clean up the, the Peace Park. So we, we're starting to kind of get engaged. Um, Patrice mentioned the Logan Airport situation. We've got a um, budding relationship with Mothers Out Front. That's the organization that does that. So we're right now we're trying to get people involved in moving toward action, as I had mentioned before. Um, so you know, with and, and that might not be the way that you're interested in collaborating, but I think if you want to reach out to Patrice and me, we could certainly have a conversation. And is the steering committee open to the general public or do you have to be a mass general employee? We have, member? we actually have someone who is a general public member. Um, so it's, it's absolutely open. The only thing that there are some barriers in terms of um, access, for instance, to Mass General Brigham related resources, um, but that's not something that would hinder someone's involvement in the steering committee at all. And again, if you're interested, you can email the Blum Center and we'd be happy to forward that message along. You talked a little bit about community efforts. Where can we learn more about efforts around communities and opportunities to become involved? Um, I, I'm sorry, I was actually reading. <laughs> I was reading a chat, so I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. So I can respond to well. And so Reverend, um, Reverend Vernon Walker is a leader in the organization Communities Responding to Extreme Weather, and he's very interested in partnering with MGB and he, uh, their work is very impressive. Suellen and I have talked about working more closely with Reverend Walker and uh, it's another example of moving our work from MGB out to the community. As some of you may know, at the National Institutes of Health, they have something called, it, the acronym is ACE, dash CH, and it's um, Achieving Community Engagement dash Climate 
at climate and health. And I've been reading more on that um, effort. And uh, I think that we have a lot of work to do about community engagement. And Sue Ellen's really been spearheading a lot of those efforts through the Cambridge Health Alliance, Harvard Medical School, Climate Health Organizing Fellowship. Thank you. Earlier in your presentation, you covered global warming six Americas. Where can we go to learn more about it? If you go to the Yale Center for Climate Change Communication, if you Google that in, um, you, you'll come up to their center. And again, they work, they collaborate with the George Mason University. Thank you. What are some ways we can begin these conversations with young children? Because I agree, it's very important in a way that it's not so scary. There are, well, first of all, Patrice and I hosted um, a large group of second graders and a large group of fifth graders. I think they were fifth or sixth. Um, and we were surprised that especially the second graders they they already know some of this stuff. I mean, it's at of course it's at a different level, but there are a lot of good books out there. Um, one of I think the book that we we read to that, or it was like a YouTube video. It was called something like the Earth, the Earth, the Earth has a fever, and it talked about global warming from the perspective of the Earth having a fever. And comparing, you know, because that's something a kid can relate to. And so it really kind of compared what was happening to the earth in terms of what happens to us when we get a fever. And it was, it was actually, it's a, it's a cute little book, I must say. So there are ways that you can definitely um, a, a address it in a gentle way, but also kind of understand that they, they they're seeing this they're they're kind of if they're watching tv they know what's going on too and i think having those discussions is actually really important because there is a lot of literature about the level of anxiety that children and young adults have and some of that has to do with the fact that you know if they're not of voting age they they're just watching us kind of not do enough and they know that they're the ones who are going to be impacted so it's causing moral distress as well as anxiety i can't remember i i can look for it the name of the book it was something about the earth having a fever that was that was actually pre pre-covid so my memory you know from covid to pre-covid days has been damaged slightly, like I think a lot of us, you know, have a different perspective after that, but I, I will definitely look for it. Again, feel free to email the Blum Center at pflc at partners.org. And if we can get that title of the book, we'd be happy to share that with you. And I just posted it in the chat. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's a video in this case, but I'm sure it'll link to the book as well. And the other thing, just as follow up to Sue Ellen's great comments, is that on the Yale School of Public Health, um, the Yale Climate Communication, there are also um, resources for educators, like K-12 educators, that are very, very rich. And as a matter of fact, another quick storytelling message to Sue Ellen's earlier point about communication my granddaughter in Boston Public Schools came home and told my son that she didn't have physical education because they had a special class on climate change. Mm -hmm. And my son shared with me, I think she needs both physical education and climate change. So that was really quite funny. But I think the point about the curriculum integration from health professionals all the way down to children is very, very important. Yeah, and someone put a comment in the chat about a, a child coming home and thinking that the you know the earth, the world was going to end. There was a study done um, of kids and young adults from the global north and the global south, and and, and there's actually another another study that I, I can't 
remember the authors of either of these, but I have them somewhere. But basically that that's a prevailing thought that children have is that the world is gonna end in their lifetime. And so again, the more you can get your kids involved in some kind of action, it's, it's gonna relieve some of that tension. And I know we have a colleague who, her daughter is very, in, you know, very involved in this. Um, she said when she goes to the grocery store, um, and in, in the way they eat, like there's minimal waste, minimal plastic um, because of her daughter's efforts to get involved. Thank you. Before we end today's session, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Thank you for your engagement and interest in climate change communication and more broadly, um, as noted by the presentation, it's often called global warming in the broader community communication. Uh, although uh, climate change tends to be the concept we often talk about. And I would like to take an opportunity to announce that save the date, our next session is gonna be on Wednesday, May 10th, same time, 12 to one Eastern time, where we'll cover health effects of extreme heat and poor air quality. Right. Thank you so much, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed today's session. As I had mentioned today, session was recorded. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have Thank a good rest of the day.